Well, and I want to welcome you specifically today to the start of a new series. We've called it 40 Days of Freedom. And what that means is for the next five weeks, the next five Sunday mornings, we're going to be looking at this theme of freedom, but not just on Sundays, as well as on Sundays, on Monday to Friday. Each day, we're going to put a short video out. We've called it 90 Seconds of Freedom, Monday to Friday, and that'll be on our YouTube channel. And so if you've not already, I just want to encourage you to subscribe, find Icon Church on YouTube and subscribe, and then you won't miss anything throughout this series. And I'm really believing that the Holy Spirit is going to move and work in our lives and bring freedom to each and every one of us. So how about we get into it today? I want to read one verse just to kick us off this morning. It's from John chapter 8, verse 36. They're the words of Jesus. And Jesus says this, So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And as I've said, we're going to believe that over the next five weeks, the Holy Spirit will bring freedom into all of our lives. Maybe freedom like we've never known before. This morning, I want to talk about the revelation we all need. And you know, there's a book out and it's called The 21 Releases of Alistair Cram. The Scottish soldier, Alistair Cram, was taken prisoner in North Africa in November 1941. And he began an incredible journey through 12 different prisoner of war camps, three Gestapo prisons and one asylum. He became a serial escapee. He actually escaped from every one of them. Alistair was able to flee his captors no fewer than 21 times. And this included Gavi, which was known as the Italian Colditz. It was a maximum security prison for the most dangerous inmates. This book, however, leaves the reader a little bit disappointed because for years he went through this cycle of release to captivity, release to captivity. 21 times he went through this cycle. He experienced or he would experience a few moments of release, hours sometimes, sometimes days, sometimes weeks, but he never truly got free. You know, this story, this book reminded me of a lot of Christians because we too can get caught up in a perpetual cycle of going from release to captivity, doing everything that we can, coming up with incredible, ingenious plans to get free, only to allow ourselves to slip back into captivity again. You know, how often on January the 1st do we say things like, this is going to be my year, only to think and say the exact same thing 365 days later. That's the story of Alistair Cram from release to captivity over and over again. And then there's the story of a young girl called Natasha Campush. Ten-year-old Natasha was snatched in 1998 and she spent eight years as a prisoner of Wolfgang Pricklopel. I've said his name right, Pricklopel. She was kept in a windowless and soundproof room under his garage. But as time went on, he allowed her to come into the house. Priklopo would alternate between treating her well, treating her nicely, and then beating and raping her. He told her that the house was rigged with explosives, and so if she tried to escape, if she tried to run, she'd lose her life. Natasha finally escaped in 2006 after eight years, and that very same day, Wolfgang took his own life, jumping in front of a train, rather than be captured by the police. On hearing the news of his death, Natasha wept and she demanded to sit with his coffin to mourn him. She actually went to live for a time in the very house where she was held captive for eight years and she would compulsively clean that house from top to bo bottom week after week after week. She even keeps a photograph, an image of her captor on her. She's liberated now, but I wonder, is she free? When she was interviewed some years later about her captivity and why she didn't run away from him and when she had the opportunity, she describes how she was taken to the door of the house many times. Her head would be shaven and her body would be bruised from the beatings and the, the rape. And he would say to her, come on now, run. Let's just see how far you get. And Natasha writes this, I was so humiliated and filled with shame that I couldn't take a single step. He tore me away from the front door, 
all those times saying, so you see, the world out there doesn't want you anyway. Your place is here and only here. Jesus said something very different, didn't he? In the words we read earlier, if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. Natasha didn't pursue freedom because she had no idea that there was a good world, a different future, a better world that was waiting for her. She thought her world just consisted in that captivity. And when it comes to our lives as followers of Jesus, sometimes there's an issue that can stop us getting free, certainly stop us getting free indeed. Notice that Jesus didn't say, if the sun sets you free, you'll be free. He actually says you'll be free indeed, truly free. The issue that can stop us, I believe, is our view of God or our revelation of God. And that's why the title of this week's message, the first in this series is this, the revelation we all need. And that revelation is this, God is good. Did you hear that? If you heard it, why don't you put it in the comments on YouTube? Why don't you put it in the chat? God is good. Maybe as a child, you were taught to pray something like this. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. About 25 years ago, if you went to any church service, you might hear something like this. God is good all the time. And I know some of you right now are replying and responding saying, and all the time God is good, because that's what would happen. The leader of the service might say, God is good all the time. The preacher might say, God is good all the time. And the congregation would respond with, all the time God is good. Who remembers that? I guess if I asked you today, is God good? Most of us would probably say yes. Certainly if I asked you, is Jesus good? I think nearly everyone would say yes without hesitation. Even most people, whether they had a faith or not, would respond, Jesus is good. So that's not my question today. My question for us today as we start this journey of freedom is how good is your God? How good is our God? I mean, it's reasonable, isn't it? It's reasonable to question whether God is good all the time. It's reasonable to question, is God good when we're disappointed? Is he still good when I'm depressed? It's reasonable to ask, is God good when I face a crisis, a sickness maybe? I think it's reasonable to question, and I think many of us have asked that question, and possibly because we haven't found a satisfactory answer, we're not quite sure how good our God really is. We're happy to say our God is good, but we're saying it with caution. We're saying it with hesitation. Maybe we're saying it with a little hesitation because we're not sure, with a little reservation. Because somewhere in the back of our mind is a question, how good is God really? I believe today that if we're going to enjoy the freedom that Jesus talked about, being free indeed, we need this revelation that God is good. I believe this really matters and my prayer is that the Holy Spirit will give us that revelation today. So to get us into this series of messages, I want to share four reasons today why I think this really matters. Four things that happen when I forget God's goodness or when I forget to focus on God's goodness or when I'm unconvinced of how good God really is. Number one. So here's the first thing. I claim the credit for things that God did. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus tells a story. It's called the story or the parable of the, the rich fool. Is this guy and he's successful and he attributes all his success and his wealth. He attributes his safety and his identity to his own brilliance. I wonder, do you know anybody like that? This guy is super wealthy. His bonds are full, his vats are overflowing with wine. And he asks the question of himself, I've got all this wealth, my bonds are full, my vats are overflowing, what shall I do now? What's next? Is there anything more? Maybe he's asking the question, there must be more to life than this. But his answer is revealing. He says to himself, I'll build bigger barns. <clears throat> I'll produce far more wine. And then I'll sit back and I'll take it easy and I'll enjoy the good life that I've made for myself. In this story, Jesus calls this young rich man a fool because he never gave God the credit for his wealth. I believe that that happens to us when we forget how good God is. In Deuteronomy chapter 8 
And verse 18, the writer says this, remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. You see, when I forget to remember God's goodness, when I question God's goodness, I claim credit for things that God has done in my life. And when I claim credit, <clears throat> the end of that can only be stress and frustration for me. Because if all the glory is coming to me, then there's not going to be much glory, you know. And the reason for this, because I, like you, have got limitations. I've got boundaries. And it's only God who is limit, limit, limitless. And it's only God who is in, infinite. So if I'm going to take the credit for myself, I'm going to be frustrated pretty quickly. And I'm going to be stressed pretty quickly. But when I give God the glory, then I can live a life of freedom. Perhaps today you're struggling with stress or frustration. Perhaps today you're experiencing fear and despair. And it may be that your focus is too much upon yourself and your own abilities and your own brilliance rather than focusing on the goodness of God and His abilities. That's the first thing. The second thing we do when we stop focusing on God's good, goodness, when we forget the goodness of God in our life, is that I stop asking God for help. You know, over 20 times in the New Testament, Jesus tells us to ask, or sorry, the Scripture, the New Testament tells us to ask. Jesus says it all the time, doesn't he? He says, ask and you will receive. And sometimes we don't ask because we think, well, I'm not going to bother God with the small stuff. I'm just going to bother God with the big stuff, you know. But here's a revelation. It's all small to God. We know that some things can be huge for us, but it's not big to God. It's not huge to God. Our big is God's small. It's all small to God. But that does not mean that God lacks interest. No, we've said it before and I want to say it again today that if it matters to you, it matters to God. And when you and I ask God for what we need, and when you and I include God in every situation of our life, when we ask God for help, that allows God to be at work in our lives and it allows God to build our trust for Him within us. Look at this picture on the screen. It's, it's called the circle of security. This is how God builds trust in our life, just the same way that a, a child builds trust in a parent and a parent builds trust in the child. This is how God builds trust in our life. We recognize, number one, that we have a need and we express that need to God. And God meets that need. Now let's pause here because God doesn't always meet our need in the way that we ask Him. And God doesn't always answer our prayers in the way that we expect Him to. But He is faithful and He does meet our needs. And sometimes it's not till much later when we look back over our lives and we see how God answered our prayer, prayers and how God responded to our ask and our cry for help that we actually realize that God met our needs. And when we realize that God meets our needs, that God provides for us, we realize that God loves us. And it's from that place, from that position that our trust grows. This is how God builds trust in your life. This is how God builds trust in my life when we ask him for help. The third thing that happens when I stop focusing on God's goodness, when I forget how good God is, is that I struggle trusting God in difficult times. Oh, look at these verses, Psalm 16, verses 1 and 2. It's David speaking. He says, keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. And then the Apostle Paul writes in the book of Romans in the New Testament, chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. He says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that our suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. Did you see what David said in Psalm 16? Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. This is David trusting God in difficult times. He's actually trusting God in a time that he, he describes in this way. You are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. This is a moment in David's life 
where he actually can't count or can't recognize anything good. It's seriously a difficult time for David. But because he knows that God is good, he's still trusting God in the midst of his difficulty. And then in Romans chapter 5, the Apostle Paul is talking about <coughs> glorying in sufferings. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm, not, I'm sure I'm not very good at this. What about you in Derby? What about you in Rotherham? Because I'm not good at glorying in sufferings. But Paul can only speak this way because he has a revelation of the goodness of God that even in the midst of suffering, God is good. Even in the midst of difficult times, God is good. You see, Paul says that God will take that suffering and he will produce from that suffering perseverance and that perseverance will produce character and that character will produce hope. We need to trust God in difficult times and we can trust God in difficult times because God is good. Come on, somebody, say it today. God is good. But when I forget God's goodness or my view of God's goodness gets distorted or diminished, I struggle to trust God in difficult times. See, I want to encourage you with this today. Make faith in God your starting point and not your last resort. You know, pastors too, we stop asking for help. We sometimes struggle to trust God in difficult times. I've got a story, I'm embarrassed to say it, but this week, you know, on, on Monday, I, I kind of pulled my back and I've, I've had a, a, a struggle with my back at, from time to time over years. And, and like, I was in a lot of pain. You could just ask Jeannie. If, and uh, I was just in a lot of pain. I was bent over. I was <coughs> leaning, leaning over. I was struggling to... Uh, sleep. I was struggling to straighten up and this happened on Monday and Tuesday was a, a terrible day, a difficult day. And I went to bed on <coughs> Tuesday night and I just woke up in so much pain at 2, uh, 2 a.m. And, and I, I, you know, I went, I went downstairs and like, I, like it was such a struggle to do anything and my back was in, you know, they say your, my back was in bits. I'm not quite sure what that means, but I was in so much pain. And then as, as I was just downstairs, I thought, I've not asked God for help. I've not trusted God with this situation. And so about 2.20 that, that morning, Wednesday morning, I said, God, I know that you're a good God. And I know this matters to me and, and, and it also matters to you. And so I'm just asking you to help me. I'm just crying out for help. You know, would you, would you do something? Would you heal me? I know that you can heal me. I want to tell you that I woke up on Wednesday morning and my back was far better, much better. It wasn't totally healed, but I want to tell you the difference between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. was miraculous. <clears throat> but we too, pastors, can stop asking God for help and we can struggle to trust in difficult times. I saw this tweet from Lecrae this week. If trusting God is a sign of weakness, then let me be weak. Anybody else, I'm, I'm in there. If trusting God is a sign of weakness, let me be weak. Let's make faith our starting point. Let's start with trust. <clears throat> and then the fourth thing that happens when I stop focusing on God's goodness and when I forget how good my God is, the fourth thing that happens is I become pessimistic about the future. Oh boy, I could stay here for a long time today, but I'm not going to. But just let me say this. I was reading my news feed the other day and I could not believe the journalism that I was reading. Here we are, we're coming out of lockdown and uh, there's a reduction of cases. There's a lessening of restrictions. And I thought we should be celebrating and we should be happy. But everything in the media I was reading was just injecting fear. It was like the journalists have this huge syringe and they're just pushing this syringe of fear into our society. Let me tell you, I think that's irresponsible and it's definitely not godly. But do you see that this happens when we forget who God is? When we forget how good God is, we become pessimistic about the future and we lose hope. Do you know the Bible calls us as followers of Jesus, prisoners of hope. Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever realized that? I, we're talking about freedom today, but I want to tell you, you're a prisoner, but you're not a prisoner of fear. You're a prisoner of hope. In other words, we should be unable as followers of Jesus to escape hope. 
That's not diminishing the things we go through or the things that we face or fear or worry about. But we should be unable to escape hope. Somewhere within us, there should be this, this reservoir of hope. And I wonder, is that how you feel today? Do you feel like you're a prisoner of hope? I wonder what a newspaper that had the values of faith, hope, and love would read like. Imagine a newspaper where all the reporters and all the journalists were convinced of the goodness of God. David speaks to this again in Psalm 27, verses 13 to 14. He says, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Can you see his his hope? Wait for the Lord, he says. Be strong and take heart. Wait for the Lord. The New King King James Version puts verse 13 like this. David says, I would have lost heart. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I would have, David says in this translation. In another translation, (coughs) it says, I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord. There it is, the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Can you see what's happening? David would have despaired. Despair was inevitable, except unless he'd believed to see the goodness of the Lord. I I don't know, is anybody else thankful for an unless? Is anybody else thankful for an except today? I was definitely on my way, David says, to despair, except I believed I would see the goodness of God. You see, hope is the anticipation of God's goodness. Let me say that again. Hope is the anticipation of God's goodness. Maybe right now you're feeling discouraged. Maybe you're fighting despair or fighting fear. Maybe today you're in a place where you're saying, I need some freedom. I need some freedom from stress, from depression. I need some freedom from despair. Well, I'm going to ask you to do two things if that's you today. The first thing I'm going to ask you to do, number one, is make a list of everything you're thankful for. Do it straight after this service. Count your blessings. Make a list of everything you're thankful for. And the second thing I'm going to ask you to do is don't miss any part of this 40 Days of Freedom series. Listen, your praise, your thankfulness is contagious, but so is your complaining. And we can choose today which garment we'll wear, whether we'll wear a garment of praise. In fact, the Bible tells us to put on a garment of praise for a spirit of despair or a spirit of heaviness. That's the antidote, put on a garment of praise. The Bible actually speaks right into this moment when we feel despair. And the way to get free is to be thankful. The way to get free is to put on a garment of praise. It's a garment that you could wear today. Or will you wear a garment of complaining, a garment of judging, a garment of criticizing? Because that garment is only going to produce despair. I I want to encourage you today, put on the garment of praise, somebody. Come on, let's have a praise break right now. Let's put on a, a garment of thankfulness. Is anybody else thankful for Jesus today? Anybody in Chesterfield, in Stocksbridge, in Sheffield? Anybody thankful for Jesus today? So as I close, I want to quote a great writer, A.W. Tozer. Tozer said this, what we think about God is the most important thing about us. So let me ask you again, how good is your God? See, I believe what Tozer said is true because even if you think nothing about God, that's the most important thing about you. Even if you're not a believer today, that's the most important thing about you. And we need to remember today that our faith, our faith in Jesus actually comes from Jewish roots. And in Jewish roots, God is not angry. He's not a God who's against us, but He's a God who is for us, a God who is good, and a God who has chosen us, and a God who is always good. That's why the very first chapter of the Bible starts with God quoted as saying, it is good, it is good, over and over and over again. Until on the last day of creation, when God makes male and female, it says, God said, it's very good. My prayer today is that God is going to shift your perspective and shift my perspective. That the Holy Spirit is going to lift off of us right now, wherever we're watching some despair, and that we will have a revelation 
the revelation that we all need that God is good. I wonder, are you ready for that? Are you ready to receive that? I believe that God is right there with you wherever you are. And so in a moment, I'm going to close with some verses and then pray. And I'm going to close with some verses because I want to leave you today with God's Word ringing in your ears. I want to leave you today with the goodness of God has declared in the Scriptures, ringing and resigning, resounding in your heart, with God's Word filling your heart and your mind today. But before I share those Scriptures, let me say this. Even when you mess up, God's disappointment with your sin is nothing compared to the greatness of His love for you. Jesus wants you to be free today from thinking you've got something to prove and position you today to receive His goodness, His grace, and His love. You know, from our perspective, failing makes us a failure. But from God's perspective, our failures are just an opportunity for His plan to come to life. This is the revelation we all need today. God is good. And even if your life is filled with unstable, unreliable, and undependable people, You have one source, one person in your life today who is constant, who is constantly loving, constantly dependable, and constantly good. Come on, somebody, let's praise Him today. His name is Jesus. He's constantly dependable, constantly loving, and constantly good. Come on, somebody, why don't you give Him a shout today? Let me share these three scriptures and then I'm going to close. 1 Chronicles 16.34 says this, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. It's on your screen. Let's say it together. Say it in your home. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Matthew 7 and verse 11, Jesus speaking says, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him. And then the final verse, Exodus 34 and verse 6. This is the most quoted verse in the Bible, by the Bible. I guess that makes it important if the Bible quotes this verse more than any other. And it says this, And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, in the Hebrew, Yahweh, Yahweh, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God. Listen to this slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. This is the revelation we all need today. God is good. Let me ask you what I asked at the beginning. How good is your God? Is He that good? I hope today the Holy Spirit has spoken to you and and changed your perspective and shifted your heart so that you can not just know freedom, but be free indeed. Because I believe when you have the revelation that God is good, You will remember to give God thanks for the things He has done and not take the credit yourself. You will remember to keep asking God for help. Maybe you need to do that today. I'm telling you, reach out. Reach out right now. Ask God for help. Maybe you've not been doing that. Ask Him to help. I believe that you will keep trusting God in difficult times. You will make faith your starting point and not your last resort. And you will not be pessimistic about the future. You will not lose hope. But like David, you will say, I would have despaired if I hadn't believed to see the goodness of God. You see, the goodness of God will not let you despair. You're believing like David today to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. If we get this revelation that God is good today, we'll find ourselves not just free, but free Indeed, if the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. I'm believing that for each and every one of us today. Lord, my prayer today for all of us who are gathered online, who are watching this message online, is that you would shift something within our spirits and whatever our understanding about the goodness of God, whatever our questioning about the goodness of God in our lives, we will have a revelation today of your goodness And that even in moments and times of difficulty within our lives, even in moments where we don't understand and we don't don't fully appreciate and understand how you are working, we will remember that you are good. 
And my prayer is for each and every one of us today that we won't just get free. We won't go on a cycle from release to captivity, release to captivity like Alistair Cram, but we will be free indeed. I pray, Holy Spirit, come right now into every home, into every life, in Jesus' name. And I thank you for it.